Welcome to the Arena Deckless Podcast. I'm Jerry Thompson, joined by Brian Gottlieb. We have another Alchemy episode. I wanted to say Alchemy Deckless Podcast. I refrained. It's cold. I have my heater on. I apologize in advance. Also heating myself, so I didn't, I didn't hang you out to dry. It has been brutally cold here in New York. I forgot what winter's like. We had a very mild winter to start, and now I am suffering through the pain of just frigid, frigid temperatures. It's unclear to me how anyone lives like this. I got my hopes up because we made it to like January without getting snow. Yep. And then I, I don't know if you saw this or heard about it or whatever, but like 30 minutes north of my place, there was a 24 hour traffic jam. I did hear about that. I didn't realize it was so close to yeah. you. Yeah, uh, That seems like a really bad situation. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. It, it was like we, we got, you know, five inches or something, but just a, a little bit slightly more north and they got upwards of like 15, I think. And wow. then I don't know exactly what caused the traffic jam. Some amount of like lack of infrastructure and like accidents yep. and everything. Right. But it just, yeah, people just ended up stuck on the highway for upwards of 24 hours, which is just completely brutal. I can't imagine. Yeah. Wild stuff. The The hardest part about this winter so far for me is that, I, I mean, like I said, it, it started mostly mild, but now it's getting cold. The problem is though, it hasn't snowed, which means like the things I enjoy about winter, which is mostly snowboarding, a little bit of like sledding. I was kind of looking forward to possibly playing some ice hockey on my pond. None of those things are happening, but I'm still suffering through like the darkness and the short days and all the stuff that comes with it. So uh, we are, we are scheduled to get like a foot of snow one day next week. We'll see if that happens. And if that's enough for the ski mountains to actually be like playable near my house, but I'm, I'm not super optimistic this far into January without any kind of basis. It's bad news. Yeah. It's honestly like it's still not that bad. Uh, Like Virginia is just one of those states where people don't really know how to drive in snow. And, Mm. you know, it's like they they don't get it super often. So there's not a whole lot of incentive to learn. And uh, there are like, you know, those those bad incentives also exist for like infrastructure as far as like how quickly the roads get like plowed and salted and like how many of the roads also get that that treatment. So when it does snow, even like the five inches, it's just like, oh, well, the state is shutting down. Yeah. So that's that's kind of awkward. But it's just it's more so just like I, you know, don't have heat in my house and I did cancel my lease and I'm moving, which I'm, you know, happy to get out of here. But moving is the worst thing. Oh, it is. Probably. So it is. Uh, I I wish you nothing but the best in that process because it is miserable and horrible. And uh, if there is any support I could lend, you let me know. I got your back. Although hopefully it doesn't involve me making the 12 hour drive down there in the freezing cold, but I would for you, Gerald, just so you know, I would, if you needed me down there, I'd be there. I was talking to Joe cause he's like a, a couple hours from me and he's like, yeah, you know, we should figure out a time when I can come down. And I was like, well, I'm moving soon. And I, I said it jokingly, like I have no intention of like letting anyone help me because it's, it is like the worst thing. And I, you know, I don't want to rope anyone into it uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. So I think I'm just going to hire movers this time, even though, You know, like financially, I probably should not, but whatever. Yeah. I mean, as far as things that are like worth the cost, movers are up there. And they're very expensive. But man, having that taken care of is, it's great. Yeah. I I found some good ones. At least it seems like that. And I will let Joe know once I'm moved into my new place. I will not tell him before that. And I'm getting... A uh, booster shot after this podcast, and then I will recover from that and start looking at places once the the booster is online and in effect. Nice. Well, I, I hope you are well boosted. Uh, my my experience was a little bit worse than the original vaccine. I was kind of knocked out for a day, but you don't tell me that. Yeah. Well, you should oh, be prepared. You're, for okay, it. you're only knocked out for a day. Like the vaccines knocked me out for a day. So okay. Yeah. There's like conflicting information on whether. It will be better for you if the vaccine was bad for you or if you may. I, I would have had almost no effects from the vaccine. And it just it just matters per person, right? Like yeah, there, there's so, so much physiology that goes into it. You can't make a blanket statement about any of that stuff. Right. So I'm I'm wishing you a speedy recovery. I think at most you're in for a day of being knocked out and then you'll be back on your feet looking for a beautiful new place to live in Virginia. Maybe just start with one that has heat. Yeah, beautiful place to live in Virginia is like, yeah, I mean, they exist. They're they're all like pretty pricey. The, hmm. 
the the bad part is is like this this house sucks so bad in like a lot of different ways, and maybe that's why the rent is like kind of cheap, and I, I have like so much space uh, again because I was like planning on hosting people if there were ever tournaments in Richmond, but then the pandemic started right, so my my big house is pretty useless. But uh, now I'm looking at like two bedroom apartments that are just more expensive to rent than the house. So yeah, yeah, rental market's kind of out of control right now, unfortunately. Yeah. So it's, it's not great. I'm not like super enthused. I, I do want to get to a place with heat, uh, ideally with air conditioning also, because, you know, by the time I move out of here, I'm just not going to have heat or I'm not going to really need the heat anyway. Right. Cause right. like hopefully the temperatures will start creeping back up. So yeah. not great timing overall, but uh change will be good. And yeah, probably, probably going to see some things happen once I get all that stuff settled. So that'll be oh, nice. Like, like what kind of things can we get? I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to put myself on the hook, man. I just got, okay. I got plans. Okay. And like for like the entirety of the pandemic, I've just felt like so blasé about everything, right? It's, it's so hard to convince me that something is worth doing or has meaning. And I am just like constantly reminded when this stuff happens where it's like, okay, you have terminated your lease. You need to find a place. You need to get out of here. I'm just like suddenly in go mode. And yeah. it feels good. Like obviously accomplishing stuff does feel good and having the need for things that you need to do everything during the pandemic. It's just like, what's the rush? Nothing matters. You know, I feel that in, in my bones or lack thereof, should it be a no bones day? But I I'm excited to see what a rejuvenated Jerry is capable of. I'm Dude, sure you have some cool stuff. going. Me on. too. It's been too long. I, I enjoy this feeling and I'm going to try and ride it past the moving and hopefully get some stuff started. Good, good. And if if I don't, I mean, you know, I warned you, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why you didn't put it on paper. Just leave yourself that out. It's always good to have an emergency exit. Yeah, and why would I hold myself accountable, you know? Right, good choice. Anyway, uh, Alchemy Day, we have a Alchemy Open. I'm so used to calling them like historic opens. I just feel like they've all been historic, you know? So I, I want to say like the, the Alchemy Historic Open or whatever, but no, it's just, it's just Alchemy. It's probably been split between historic and standard, hasn't it? I probably. guess there's also, there's been a draft and sealed one as well. They're, they've really covered some bases so far. No, they have. I, I think the spread has been pretty good, but I don't know. Just in my in my mind, it just always wants to talk about historic. But yeah, so yeah like, historic is the most arena-y format, right? Like I think it's the one with the hardest tie to arena thus far. Although yeah. Alchemy trying to make a case for it sort of shooting itself in the foot. I would like to talk more about that before we talk about specific decks, if you're interested. Absolutely. What else are we here for? So the the Open is a two-day event. You buy in on day one. You play either best of one or best of three. Qualify for day two. You win some matches on day two. You can win some money. So that's cool. Bad news is, is they announced that they're probably going to make changes to the format after this, and Alchemy still has no you know recourse for like giving you wild cards for like things that they nerf. Who thought that was a good idea? Who thought it was a good idea to say on the moment where your new format is about to have its like kind of debut? And that's that's another part of the whole issue here is as we sit down to do this show and I go to look back over the events that have occurred since the launch of Alchemy, there basically are none. Again, shoot the format in the foot as it tries to come out the gate by not building hype about it, not having an alchemy tournament series or something to sort of announce its presence on the scene. So that's strike one against this format, which I have said from the beginning is hyper reliant on how much attention, love care it's going to get. That's really what defines the alchemy format and what had me excited about the alchemy format. Um, I'm not excited anymore. Like they've, they've just done it again. Who is going to buy into a format where you say, we're not making it. We, we think there's a good chance we need to do some changes, but we're not going to make them until after this event when you have purchased the cards you need to play under these terms. And by the way, when we change these cards, you're not getting shit. Shut up, buy more alchemy cards, and I don't want to hear it from you. I am out. I am out on this idea that you can fleece me forever. Give me wild cards or I'm not going to play alchemy. I promise I can do my job as an observer. I can watch. I can read, I can learn, and I will use that to put forth informed alchemy opinions that I think will be useful to our listeners. I will not play 
until you find a way to rectify the situation because asking people to buy in on these cards and then being like, we're going to change them. And granted, thanks for telling me because it lets me know just how clown shoes the decision making is over there where you think I would still give you my money at this point. It's, it's not happening. I am, I'm waiting until you do something that addresses this problem. But still, thanks for telling me. I can't in good faith recommend anyone participates in this when everything you buy, and it's not only the, the alchemy cards that you may buy, everything surrounding it could change next week. So if you have stuff laying around to play alchemy with, sure, go for it at that point. Uh, would I spend a penny getting specific cards I needed? Absolutely not. No chance. The funny part about all of it is, is that if they were at least good at fleecing people of their money and having them not feel bad about it. Like I would respect that, Mm -hmm. but instead they're like, Hey, we're going to have this tournament. And then they also announced before the tournament that they're going to make changes after it, which is bad for all the reasons that you said. But then there are, there are now also people who like you are just like, well, then I'm not going to buy into alchemy and I'm not going to play in this tournament because you made this announcement. So from a money-making perspective, they've also just messed up. And granted, I think that like, after a, a big tournament where they have a bunch of data, they are likely going to make changes and they have a bunch of data already that maybe they're going to use to make changes. So I I think it is nice for them to make the announcement. But if, if you know that you're going to make changes, do it before the event and give them like two or three weeks time to like play with the new versions of the cards or whatever, or, or just like don't announce it before the event so that a bunch of people play in the event, maybe not even thinking about the fact that their cards are going to get nerfed and I think it's pretty reasonable for people to assume that like after the tournament is over, now you have data to make changes. Like they could have just not announced that they were going to make changes. And if they made changes after the tournament, it would have been fine. Right. The issue here is that they're playing both sides. And if, if alchemy is just a complete wild card of a format and everything you buy can change at a moment's notice and you never know if your cards are secure. Okay, I I would make that sacrifice if you're telling me this is the most actively managed format we can have. Things will change before tournaments. It's the first first few months of Pioneer. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, okay, Uh, like those were exciting months, quite frankly. And I was okay with the buying at that point because the return I was going to get is what would ultimately end up being a balanced Pioneer format, which we did a show on last week and sort of alchemized. Sorry, I don't mean to do that, but it, it, it came together before our eyes based on that way of just altering things really quickly. And, and alchemy could have turned that up to 11 because you can actually alter not only the card pool, but the cards themselves. And that's probably what you're going to do. And that's interesting. But now you're telling me you don't want to do that either. You want this half measured approach where th- it's not going to be a fresh meta game going into this tournament. Like in some ways, mm, I won't say this meta game is solved, but we know what the main targets are. I think it would have been really interesting to shuffle those targets up and been like, okay, here's what we're doing for the open. You never know what's going to break out here. And you can kind of start from square one. That's still interesting to me. What I get now is a format where there's only occasionally things to do in it. Most of the play is meaningless. And then after the rare thing to do happens, they change everything. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking for constant flow or just a more measured approach, a more structured approach. And this doesn't either. So. Yeah. And I, I think at this point, it's pretty easy to identify the cards where it's like, okay, maybe this is pushed like a little bit too much. Mm-hmm. And I can certainly make guesses to two of the cards that they're going to change. Me too. And it's probably because like this format has congealed around some specific alchemy cards, which distances it from standard in a good way, I think. But if they're all changing, like, I, I, I don't know. I just don't, I don't feel like you've done a good job presenting a clear identity for what this format is going to be. And again, another thing I said was like communication. You could talk a bunch about it. If, if you give me a breakdown of why this is the approach you take and you recognize this trade off, but here's kind of how we're looking at things. And, you know, if we did anything here, it would have been this. But instead, if you want to put all your cards on the table, I'm down with that. Yeah. Instead, you put out a 280 character tweet that's just like, eh, we're going to change stuff after the tournament. That's not what I'm looking for. It's not what I'm here for. And I'm, I'm not buying into that. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's, there's information we don't have access to. Right. And I, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. Well, I meaningful information we don't have access to. Obviously there's a lot of information we don't have access to, but yeah, if they want to approach it like that, I think that would be cool. If, if I were introducing this format, I would be like, okay, release it on uh, a Thursday 
like they normally do, right? And then give like two or three weeks for people to, you know, play with the cards, uh, stream the format, et cetera, et cetera, then have an open around that time, either two or three weeks after release. And then I would try to highlight, you know, some of the cooler decks from that event. And I don't know what the ROI on that sort of stuff is for them. I assume that it's probably pretty bad, but like, if we're talking about getting people to buy into a brand new format on MTG Arena and you're talking about maybe converting uh, some folks who aren't on Arena or are lapsed Arena players, you know, it's like I, I think that the ROI could be big on that stuff if you wanted to actually focus on this and try and use it as a selling point. But instead, they're just like, all right, we'll we'll release this thing that no one asked for. We're not going to do any work to, like, create hype for it. We'll just, like, let the format stagnate and then announced that we're going to be like changing some stuff, but oh, also here's this tournament. If you want to like buy into it before we nuke your collection, you know, it's just like none of this seems like a good way to go about it. Yeah. I, this feels like a format, which is supposed to have patch notes, basically again, not to exclusively focus on TFT. the games that I am enjoying playing right now for a very clear reason, but the TFT patch notes are ridiculous. They're not only are they, long and detailed and thoughtful and sometimes funny the lead designer also puts out like an hour video retrospective of the last patch saying what went right what went wrong as well as an hour explanation of the new patch saying this is why we did these things and like that shit matters to me it's both interesting and insightful and i really hope we might get something along those lines with alchemy but nope it would be cool i mean Mero has done those retrospectives for like 25 years or whatever at this point, right? And they've continued those because people enjoy them. You know, yes. they like they like a little peek behind the curtain and like to know what's going on and everything. And plus, it's just interesting. So I think that that would be nice, but whatever. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Let's, let's talk about Alchemy decks. I like discussing formats in terms of pillars. Yes. How do you feel about that? I like it. You have, you know, the I've worked with you for, uh, I don't even know, four years, five years now. And this was definitely uh, your approach, but I've, I've worked it into my own analysis. I think it's a smart way to look at things simplified uh, a little bit and also very useful. It, it tells you what to prepare for in clear terms and very grokkable terms. And that's the best thing about the bucket system. So my goal is to like, you, you look at the format of alchemy, I think is a pretty good example because it is relatively new and you see all these different variants of decks and people are trying all these new things and you're just like, but you know, like what's good, what's not good. How do you, how do I approach this format, especially for someone who is new to try and like distill what the format is actually about. And I think that it can be put into three distinct buckets and generally how I look at it is I want to get it down to the fewest number as possible. Obviously there are some formats I think like modern right now is probably one that uh, is kind of hard to distill just because there's like 20 viable decks and they don't necessarily overlap on cards and whatnot. So uh, in this case, it kind of is to me. And I think that those buckets are uh, in no particular order, town raiser, tyrant, inquisitor, captain, and key to the archive. And I look at it like these are sort of the best three things to be doing. And if you are not doing one of these three things, you need a good reason to, or you're probably making a mistake and like putting yourself at a huge disadvantage. Yeah. And there, there is like one sort of glaring exception. There is. But I think you have a good reason for accepting it. We can talk about that when we get to the key to the archive section, I'll sure. say. But it is, it's fascinating that these buckets are all focused around alchemy cards. And that's what's really giving this whole format its sense of identity right now is is these cards are shaping everything. They're just the best thing to be doing. And if I were to put something up for nerfs, it's it's probably these three cards. I, I think they are above and beyond what else is offered in the format. They're mostly interesting. I don't hate them being the best. I mean, you know, take it over Alrin's Epiphany every day of the week. And yes. I, I do still think Alchemy in terms of gameplay is a far better format than standard. Also, how's that standard format doing, Jerry? Are people still really interested and engaged with that? I have no idea. They're not. They're not. Like I told you it would happen. Uh, never mind. 
let's just talk alchemy. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. I, I have not seen anyone talk about it. I have not been interested in all. I have maybe seen some Magic Online results where it's like, oh, Epiphany's doing pretty well, huh? That's weird. And, you know, people are playing in the tournaments on Magic Online, like specifically just the challenges because there's money to be made. And everyone has a price, right? If you get the, if you get the number high enough, I'll probably do whatever. Do, do you know who the million dollar man is? Uh, I, I, I know the name, like wrestler, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah, I, I you would you would enjoy. No, you wouldn't. I, I enjoy. I'm just going to take credit for this. I enjoy the Million Dollar Man in uh, old wrestling. One of my favorite characters ever because it was extremely cartoonish, extremely silly, as was the mode of wrestling during the 1980s. But also there was this element of truth to it where like the Million Dollar Man just came around and he debased audience members and made them do terrible things for money and would like buy, he bought the championship for himself once. And he just basically used money to skirt all the rules of competition and just show that everything was up for alteration should you have enough money. And it was both terrible and insightful and very cartoonish and entertaining at the same time. So I actually think that's the high point of wrestling creative is the million dollar man. What about inflation though? (laughs) What would he He, be now? He would have to be like a billion dollar man. He has been beaten up by inflation. He was just unfathomably rich at the time as the million dollar man. And now I think, you know, he's doing well for himself, but certainly can't just buy wrestling championships at a whim. That's that's not going to work these days. Yeah. Before that, what were we talking about? I have, I have no <laughs> idea. Probably magic, if I had to guess. Oh, doing things for money. Yes. What, <laughs> Speaking what, of, back to the podcast. What? Yeah. Would I play a standard challenge, you know, like nine or ten hours of Epiphany for like 250 bucks? Mm, I, I don't know. Maybe uh, give me give me six months. I might be there. We'll see. But, you know, movers are not cheap, right? Right. Uh, but right now, at this specific point in my life, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I will pass. Yeah, I, I wish more was done to preserve standard. It, it's a shame, honestly. I know I'm like joking about it. it. It is a shame. There was potential there. And the standard chat in our Discord has like four messages in the last month. Nobody cares. They did do stuff. They made alchemy, though. Yep, they sure did. And in alchemy, there are three buckets of decks that we can yes. talk about. You, okay, so first of all, I have to say that uh, I, I had to write about alchemy this week, which meant that I also had to buy into alchemy a little bit more. Okay, they get you every time. Uh, I was not happy about it, and I don't know. Even though Cedric's on his way out, he's still he's still cracking that whip, you know. Yeah, making me work. making me work for my money, spend money to make money, etc. It's a, a fine justification on my end, but like personally, I feel really sad about it that I've I've actually like redeemed wild cards for these cards, knowing how the format's currently being handled. So the deck that I wrote about, like I took a a cursory glance at the format and tried to figure out like, you know, what would look appealing and strong. And I really liked the look of uh, some of the mono red aggro decks, like not the dragons deck specifically, but the aggro ones. And those ones are also pretty mid range leaning, you know, Mm -hmm. like they have some planeswalkers, they have town raiser tyrants, they have like some five drops in the sideboard, et cetera, right? So it's, it's kind of similar to dragons. They just a- end up having some pretty good grizzly bears too. And I know that you were high on the dragons deck and I had like played against town razor tyrant, but it's, it's a hell of a card. It is. I mean, per- persistent damage. It passes the, the check for a modern creature, right? Like it enters the battlefield and then impacts the game in, in some ways in a larger way than you would expect because that persistent damage going on throughout the game should you not sacrifice a land and that's that's not something we're asked to do in the current world of magic like you you get your lands and you keep them nobody messes with that town raiser tyrant does though and granted it's a punisher mechanic but both of those choices are actually punishing and always punishing that it's it's just such a beating in so many scenarios to say nothing of the large body with a very good tribal type left behind I like this card in the preview season. I knew I would play it. We sort of missed the boat on including it in our top 10. We, I think we went with uh, the whelp instead, which I, I get. Like That's what sort of was the foundation of the archetype. But Town Razor Tire, it, it, it can just go everywhere. It's such an impressive card, and it deserves to be one of the buckets. Yeah, that's the thing that I did not expect, is that it was going to show up in more places than like just Dragon Dax or like yep. dedicated mid-range red sort of stuff. 
So yeah, for the top 10 list, I also kind of enjoy doing the bucket thing where it's like, yeah, maybe Tyrant is the card that, you know, deals you damage or whatever, but like this dragon deck would not exist without the whelp, right? So that's kind of why I go that way. But there's like no other card in the format where if your opponent misses their third land drop, they just almost automatically lose the game. True. And Town Razor Tyrant is that card. True. Yeah, and uh, definitely variance punishing. That's not a way I've actually thought about the card before, but you're right. It, it, you can't come back from that. The damage done at that point is so huge. I mean, especially when you're doing it at an accelerated rate. You're playing this on turn, turn three. It, you just can't come back from that scenario. Uh, I'm fine with casting it on turn four. But yeah, like certainly turn three in those instances is even more punishing. And I've also just found a lot of instances where even if they don't miss their third land drop, if, if they miss their fourth land drop, it's still very good. Like, basically, if they stumble at all, it's awesome. But, like, even if they don't stumble, it, it, you're still putting the screws to them, you mm-hmm. know? And early on, you can't really afford to sacrifice that land, especially when I have a 4-4 four, four flyer, because you have to do things in order to keep parity and try and win the race. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm dealing you, like, two or four damage, and then your land goes away, which could stymie you a little bit. Right. So, yeah, it's a punisher mechanic, but when both the options are excellent for you, then it doesn't really matter. And I've certainly had some games, uh, you know, it goes to like turn 10 or whatever, where its ability doesn't really matter, but it's still a, f- a four mana four four. It's still fine. Right. Yeah. There's, there's no fail state for this card. It, it just doesn't exist. And you're very happy to play it at almost all stages of the game. So the fact that it also trades well with like Goldspan Dragon, I, I think is important as well. It, it has good blocks. There's other flying creatures in the format that matter. So yeah, just an all around impressive beater. And, probably it's weird to say but should be seeing more play than it does like yes. I, I think like branching any any deck that is playing red and looking to deal damage should probably consider this as a real option and we are starting to see that a little bit so i i started with mono red i i know that the the dragons decks have had a reasonable amount of success but i didn't really like the idea of just like play big thing and like hope my opponent loses like i wanted a little bit of early game, maybe like some blockers against like all these decks that are very good at going wide. And I wanted like the early pressure against the control decks. And I wanted like a little bit of card advantage and the dragons didn't necessarily provide that against decks with infernal grasp and stuff like that. So I I like the look of mono red aggro because you have things like Rahilda and bloodthirsty adversary and you get to play Chandra, which obviously like a lot of the dragons decks do too. But then your five drop being Tybalt is kind of like what drew me to it, where it's like, yeah, this seems like a better top end to have in the matchups where you're grinding a little bit. Interesting. And you're talking about Alchemy Tybalt, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a that's a full mythic right there. That's, that's Dude, costly. it's bad. Okay, so I have my final list for Mono Red, right? Like my article is submitted. I did a bunch of testing and I submitted the sideboarding plans and everything. I did what I could to maintain some dignity And by that, I mean, I played maybe like the last 10 games that I played with like a 13 card sideboard because I only had like three Tibbles and three Conducive Blasts. I was just, or Conducive Current, whatever it's called. I was just like, I'm not going to get all of these cards. Like, and it's not going to meaningfully change my testing, whether or not I have access to the fourth Tibble, even though I feel like I want it in certain matchups. Right. You, You understand the quality of that card. You'll just draw it less often with your lacking copy, but you are able to put forth the information for the people who are ultra whales we're only whales now there's ultra whales we've been supplanted yeah and uh, some of some of it too was trying to get in the experience like playing best of one so i wasn't even mm-hmm. using my sideboard the entirety of the time anyway so you know i have a lot of uh justifications for not going full whale i support all of them hell yeah tybalt is a weird card tell me tell me more about your experience with it all right so it's five mana three starting loyalty plus one is add rr draft a card from tybalt's spell book exile it and then until end of turn, you can cast it. So if this you, is a pretty medium spell book, right? Yeah, it's like some random devils, you know? Yeah. And yeah, it's it's pretty medium. I think it's like above average, maybe for like a lot of the spell books, I guess. But whatever. It's like you get like a, a three mana, three, three, and like a five mana, five, five, and whatever. The other plus one is three to a creature, Maybe your Planeswalker too, unless your opponent takes three damage. If they do take the three damage, you can rummage. And then minus X make X devils. And so you have this tension where like the first plus one, you might not even be able to cast the card you get off it. The second plus one is 
Punisher mechanic in like the worst way, but like yep. if you choose, if the, your opponent chooses to take the three, you get to rummage. So like you're getting a slightly better deal when they do the thing that you don't want them to do, I guess. And then the other thing is like a pretty mediocre, like devil creator thing. So it didn't look that appealing, but like the more I played with it, it's just like, it doesn't matter. It's like creating extra cardboard. I very rarely used the Punisher plus one mm. just in very specific scenarios where it was like, my hand is like maybe garbage. You have a thing that I want to kill, but I'm pretty sure that you're going to like take the three and like that three damage is also relevant. And I want to rummage, you know, it's like that is so much rarely better than just like drafting a card. Cause you can just hit a five mana five, five that matters. Right. Right. So a lot of it is like you play it. And then if you need the loyalty, because your opponent has, I don't know, like a three damage burn spell or whatever, you can plus one and like try and spike some of the two mana cards, or you just like make two devils and then you just draft every turn from the rest of the game. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's a weird card, but it's, it's actually been pretty solid. And I don't think that there's a better five mana card advantage option for red. So it's like, yeah, it's fine. It gets the job done. Uh, that's cool. I, I like these cards filling those niche roles because I think that's important to having a well-rounded metagame. I hate that they are mythics, but that is besides the point here. From a play pattern, I, I get it. I get why you want Tybalt. Yeah, uh, Rahilda is also a mythic. That's the werewolf robber of the rich. Yeah. Uh, two drop, and that card is just awesome. And you're playing that in just your straight mono red list. Yeah. Very cool. The, the other thing that Town Razor Tyrant has been doing a bunch is teaming up with werewolves. And I, I think this is the big change for this deck where it was hyper, uh, I, I won't say quite linear. It had multiple game plans, but it was it was very werewolf focused previously, maximizing Tovalar, which I was fine with. I think there's a lot of really good werewolves, but y- you get to a point where you recognize a card is just too good to exclude. And I think Town Razor Tyrant has passed that mark. So they're getting more... Uh, ramp focused. You see Jespera Sentinel working its way to a bunch of these decks. And I love the way these decks have evolved. I think they're quite a bit better than they were when the format started. Yeah, I do too. Uh, certainly, like picking up things like Rahilda, uh, Tenacious Pup is solid too. Yep. Like they, they matter a lot. And recognizing that you don't need to be all in on werewolves, like there, there's not really a reward for all of your things being werewolves, right? So it's like, Jasper Sentinel is okay. Some of the decks also have Magda. You just have some amount of werewolves and then you play like a, to- a couple Tovalars or whatever. And like, that's generally just fine. It's just like you, you end up incidentally having some wolves and werewolves because they're kind of like the best aggressive creatures. And then you play a couple Tovalars just because they're solid. Once some of your creatures are werewolves. Makes sense to me. Uh, an- another card that's been popping up in both alchemy and standard Halana and Elena partners. What are your thoughts on this card? Because every time I play against it, I'm like, this feels extremely win more for a four mana play. And I've yet to see scenarios where it's really like fundamentally altering gameplay in a way that any four drop would do. And I think like there's quite a few three drops, which have a better impact on the battlefield. Certainly I'm playing all my town razor tyrants before I get to any of these in the four mana slot. It's interesting though, that this has seen such proliferation lately. Yeah. Lupine Harbingers is fine too. Yep, it's like a pr- really good finisher and Uvenwald old oddity or whatever there's, was already. There's a few play, of them, and know? that's that's why I was very surprised to see this card sort of gain a foothold. I mean, I, I think like it's it's huge games are huge, and it's going to be very clear that this card has pushed things in a ridiculous direction. But as is often the case with Winmores, it's not clear that it does much from a position where you're behind. It doesn't really stabilize all that well. So where where have you been on this card? So I think that. It's reasonable for breaking board stalls, but I also think that board stalls don't happen that often. Mm-hmm. So I, I get wanting to reach for like that sort of effect. Uh, in theory, it's like also solid with tenacious pop, although like the sequencing on that it can be kind of awkward too. So I I don't think it seems all that strong. It, it also like takes a few turns in order for that board stall break to actually happen. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I basically don't like it. I feel like you just play another good card or like a removal spell or something and you're you're probably fine. But I, I certainly appreciate people trying out new things, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't work for me, but I, I understand the draw. I think you can find better options right now. Oh, uh, there's Ravenous Pursuit in some of these sideboards, too. 
Okay. It's so like the uh, fight, but you can public creature in your hand if you do excess damage. So, yep. yeah, I, I could see how it could maybe get out of control, but it's also just like put that on a 4-4 four, four trample haste. Yeah, anything. Accomplishing anything. a lot of the same stuff. So, whatever. Right, right. Yeah, uh, after after playing with Mono Red, I, I definitely like it, but, you know, seeing these werewolves decks, it's like, oh, okay, I want to try those out too because they, they look pretty appealing. So I think the reason folks went from mono red to werewolves is that they like the werewolves decks have more things that are like three and four toughness and the red decks can struggle to do well against them. But my red deck had four thundering rebukes main, which I didn't really see anyone else doing. And I was kind of confused by that. Yeah. I mean, that's a very clear tool for a specific situation. I I get it. I I know a lot of the decks I was building early on in alchemy, that was often a removal spell I went to in my red decks. Yeah. You have all these, Three toughness things. There's righteous Valkyrie. There's Town Razor Tyrant for mirror matches. Like if you want your small red deck to compete against big red and kill a gold span dragon and stuff, it's like you need removal spells like that. And so you know people had some amount of brittle blast in their deck or whatever. But like yeah. I don't know what's what's five toughness that's that that actually matters all that much. Uh, Thundering Rebuke does a lot of the same job for one less mana, and I'm still playing brittle blast to some degree. So I just have a lot of those effects because I want a lot of them. But if people aren't playing them, then Werewolves seems good because you get the aggression from Mono Red and your stuff is harder to kill. So, Yeah, I think you're also really good at generating resources as well, which is an important theme for the Alchemy format. Things like Tovalar are Everyone is. to have. Everyone yeah. is, which is why I don't really like the Dragon's deck because if they kill your first like two or three threats, you're just out of gas and have nothing. Yeah, so I, I want to touch on the Dragon's deck Real quick, I've seen it evolve a little bit. I I think that criticism of it is fair. One of the things that the deck has done is gone to Boros. Uh, I know a Boros Dragons deck did well in an event this past weekend. It it seems weird that adult gold dragon could be a meaningful card, but when you talk about exactly what you're talking about, getting outscaled, the ability to do instant damage, burst damage is extremely, extremely important. And I, I sort of like it. I, I, I think it makes sense to play a card which is on its face as mopey and it's foolishly named as Adult Gold Dragon. <laughs> but 4-3 Flying Lifelink Haste, that's a, that's a real difference maker in a lot of races. It is, but I'd rather just have interaction. Because you're just like, well, if we're in a close race and I'm going to lose, having this lifelinker will help me. And it's like, well, maybe not playing like crappy five mana cards would help you. You know, well, fair criticism. The other thing this Boros deck seems to be doing is playing Divine Purge now. Yeah, so. and that card is good. And I, I have Conducive Blast or Conducive Current. I, I don't know. All the names are made up, right? Yes, all the, fictional. The RRR sweeper in my sideboard, like that's a that's a reason to not play Faceless Haven. Uh, in addition to like it being kind of weak now, so I, I definitely like having access to a sweeper and being able to become like big creatures plus sweepers against the Inquisitor Captain decks. That makes sense. Uh, the knock I have about this particular build of Boreal's Dragons is we're getting away from the Chandra stuff, which was a way to actually play some longer games for this deck and to also stay with the A plan. So it, it's even more so, here are the cards in my hand, hope they are good enough. And they often will be. I, I think this deck is fine. But there's so many good options in this format that never have to play those games, and I, I'm going to take the resource search option every time. Dude, Chandra is so good. Like it is not. Yeah, I've been impressed with it. Not not like busted good, but it, she's just easily one of my favorite cards. I love that card. Good. I'm I'm glad you got a win, Gerald. I'm glad you found a, a nice planeswalker for yourself. Hell yeah. Uh, I I mean, it does require me to play a lot of red cards. Yeah, that that's the downside. But the red cards are okay right now for the most part. Yeah, I I like the way that this red deck is built, and you know that's another reason why I gravitated towards it is because you have these creatures that you know, brawl pretty well and can kind of like run away with a game on their own. And then you have pretty good removal. You have some card advantage. You have a good sideboard plan. It's like, I love everything about this, even if, you know, the specific strategy or cards are not things that I'm a big fan of, you know, and getting to play Chandra in a deck like that. I'm just like, this is perfect. And the deck ends up being quite good too. So how much of the appeal is the fact that it plays like a standard deck from like four or five years ago? Uh, I mean, alchemy kind of does to some yeah. degree, you know? So yeah. like the, the format itself is not bad. I agree. And I wish that there was more incentive to do stuff with it. You know, I'm definitely in the camp 
that you're in of just like kill standard, make this format not as predatory, actually promote it a little bit. And I think good things will happen on, unless, you know, a lot of mistakes get made, right? In, in I'm, like- I'm surprised how many people have a positive reaction. I kind of thought I would get flamed for the kill standard take, but a lot of people seem on board with what is this even doing at this point? Yeah, it's weird. It's like there are so many people who would maybe identify as standard players, at least when organized play was like at, at its peak. They're just yeah. like, I like standard the most. And then you're just like, murder it. And they're like, yeah, actually, that's not a bad idea. You know, it's just like, yep. I do primarily play standard and I do enjoy it, but we could do so much better. We could. Absolutely could. So it, it's it's cool where I feel like maybe you didn't get people's like knee jerk reactions where you're just like, I want to kill your darling, you know, or maybe people have just like slowly realized over the course of like their standard experience being fairly poor the last few years that they're just like, yeah, this is not the answer. That just speaks to the brilliant, measured, and uh, very thoughtful audience we've cultivated over the years here at the Arena Decklist podcast. Well, that that's definitely true too. Two ideas like this. There, uh, you're going to get a very large disparity of responses if you post on Twitter versus like in our Discord, you know? Yeah. Or if you post something on Reddit, say it turns out oh, things. Oh, y- uh, yeah, that that's going even further than than Twitter because at least Twitter is you know ten thousand people who've decided that they want to read your tweets, right? Yes, I I got a wave of new followers this week, and I was like, oh no, what's happening? Because that's that's always a sign of disaster when just a bunch of new followers show up. What happened? What'd you do? Somebody posted one of my tweets to Reddit. Oh, yeah. Oh, and then there's just like a hundred and fifty comments talking about how I'm an idiot. And uh, obviously, <laughs> don't understand things. So but, it's, but it's then just there's like ten people great. who are like, "Oh, he's not an idiot. I'm going to follow yeah, him on and, Twitter." And for what it's worth, the most upvoted comment was someone being like, "Yeah, this makes a lot of sense." But then you just go through thread after thread of obviously this person knows nothing. Look, he didn't include this obvious information in this 280 character tweet, so there's no way he understands anything. It's oh, real- is that the tweet that was the? I don't know. You were like me in like I don't know me an idiot, you an intellectual, or whatever that one. Yes, okay. that, that would be the one that inspired that. Internet's a weird place, man. Yeah, I don't know. I see stuff like that, and I'm just like, I'll take a glance at your previous tweets because I assume it happens there because I don't know where else you would have some interaction and then tweet about it. So I didn't I know. Like I, to, didn't know I like to play this bizarre game of like being both opaque and obvious at the same time. That's what I really enjoy about posting on the internet is like all the all the things are there. Like if you are a, a devote me fan, first, get some help. Second, you can put together the pieces from back in time and understand what I'm pointing at. But if you just see this tweet in no context, I, I sort of, I want to go a little bit over your head and maybe you still get something out of it. Yeah, I I used to treat things like that where it was a continuity. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I was just under the assumption that like, if you read my articles, you're going to read them every week. Because, not true whatsoever. Yeah, it's not. Uh, nope. So for, because that's how I handle things, right? It was like, if there was someone who I liked to read, I would just read them every week. And then I kept getting these negative responses to me handling things like that. And it, it took a while for that realization to happen where it's like, oh, this is just like not a good thing to do. You know, like, yes, I would, I would skim over like concepts because I had written about it two years ago or something. Like everything else in my life, I've decided to approach it in a way that works solely for me. Yeah. And <laughs> not really care about and, the and that's fine. implications. Yeah. O- over time, I've been like, oh, I should try to make this easier for everyone. And then I'm kind of pushing back on that because it, it, I don't know. I'm also like not seeing any sort of like positive affirmation from that. So sure. Yeah. What's, what's the return? Yeah. What's in it for me? Yeah. What if, what if I just skip this paragraph? You know, who cares? Done. Anyway, uh, Town Razor Tyrant's good. Attack people. That strategy is good. I like it a lot. I wrote about Mono Red, but I think werewolves might be better. I would also lean that way. I, I haven't seen your Mono Red list, but in the dark, uh, I, I think werewolves is very strong right now, basically, and has the tools to compete with our other buckets that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I don't know exactly how to build werewolves, but you probably can't mess it up too much. Yeah, a lot of flex slots, but they're all powerful. So. Yep. Other bucket, Inquisitor Captain. Collected company, but Brian Proof, which is great, yes. works well yes. with Glass Pool Mimic, is uh, a cleric, right? Yes. So a lot of stuff going for it, and is I don't know, it's like very clearly one of the defining cards of the format, right? 
Yep. And I think more importantly, the glass pool mimic stuff has opened up a lot of sideboard space for decks. Uh, it's very easy to facilitate your blue splashes now because you're just jamming for that card anyway. And the chains are really good. So this is, again, another card that feels like it came in a little too hot, probably needs to be taken down a peg. And that's going to affect both historic and this format. And I would rather just get it out of the way now. But for the time being, it's certainly a focal point. I continue to be sort of medium about the clerics lists and maybe uh, against the face of evidence. Like they seem to do pretty well over time, but it, it feels like a lot of hoops to jump through to make big bodies where big bodies are sort of not what this format is about because it does scale so well over time. And, you know, there's things like, is it control decks available? There's Azorius control decks available. And all these things are fine with big bodies. They will they will do their work to get around them. The things that will struggle a little bit, stuff like you're saying, mono red, sh- sure, brick walling them is worth a lot. And Esper Clerics is pretty good at that. But if I'm looking to play a captain deck, I'm leaning a little bit more towards a mono white take, uh, a little bit more streamlined take, rather than trying to really get this uh, pyre of heroes synergy build going on. What what I want these decks to do is you can play Voice of the Blessed and Righteous Valkyrie if you want, but don't play the bad stuff that goes along with it. Like don't yeah. get don't get uh, tempted by like Pyre of Heroes or uh, uh, those sorts of things. Just like play as many good cards as possible, and if you get to have some cleric synergies to build like high toughness bodies that's a bonus but some of the cleric stuff is also just pretty bad in the format agreed and this was a a revelation i sort of went through with my party deck building as well where it's like oh i can work really hard angel of unity is awesome yep and that's a reason to play clerics or is not a reason to play clerics agreed you you don't have to work as hard to get like i've talked about minimum effective dose before on the podcast where you basically do the least possible to get the largest return. And I think a lot of these clerics cards pay you with very little investment, including Angel of Unity. You don't have to go full party. You don't have to push all the way to Aura. Just because it says clerics on it doesn't mean you necessarily want to play it in your clerics deck. Right. Uh, And the more you get away from that and just play the good cards, the better I think these setups are going to be. Yeah, I I agree completely. So if I were doing something like this, I mean, first of all, I'd be concerned because I think this was public enemy number one. And a lot of people have caught on like divine purge is a popular card. Mm-hmm. The the red decks are playing sweepers and some amount of removal that kills big toughness bodies. So you need something else other than just like, I, I play like a three toughness creature every turn, you know, and the pyro of heroes thing is not cutting it. It's, it's cute. It's just very slow. And I would probably just try and rebuild this sort of deck from the ground up. Yeah, you could you could sell me on the idea that Pyres of Hero Pyre of Heroes makes sense as a sideboard card in some scenarios. Sure. I I do not think it's what you should be building your deck around. Yeah. Agreed. Uh is is there any other place you like this card? Because it doesn't all have to be like clerics or mono white aggro, right? I've seen I've seen this splashed successfully into, for example, Gruel Werewolves. Yeah, and I, I think that's quite cool. I I think anything that is going to hit this threshold without a bunch of work, it merits consideration. This card is just that powerful. So any deck which is naturally playing a bunch of small bodies, you should look to see if you could stretch a little bit to fit in Inquisitor Captain for now, because I have to believe this card is changing. So, Yeah, that too. I don't know. It depends on your your situation. Like if you think like the Captain decks are the best, but they require the most wild cards, like... You know, do you buy in and try and spike before it gets nerfed or do you try and stick with something like a little sturdier or whatever? I, th- I think that's up to each individual, but it's something to consider for sure. For for me, I don't think the gap is large enough. Even if I concede it's like the best card, I don't think the gap between it and the other buckets is so big that I would be hard incentivized to buy into it. Yeah, same. I mean, especially if you've already done something like purchase Town Raiser Tyrants, you know, yep. it's like you can just do something with that and probably be fine. Agreed. Uh, the other one is key to the archive and the thing that those three buckets leaves off is mono black sacrifice 
But I think that that deck should be playing key to the archive. And I agree completely. A lot I of agree. folks we, aren't. So we did this weeks ago, actually, on our, our first mono black discussion in Alchemy. We were big on adding key. Yeah, and at, at first I was like, I tried Loth and Blood on the Snow, and it's like those cards were okay against some stuff, and pretty bad as the format as a whole. As things have kind of solidified, I think that those cards are pretty good again because of the presence of werewolves and uh, clerics and even to like some extent the control decks. Uh, so I would be fine playing bigger cards versus like the super streamlined version I had. But if you're going to do that, some of those cards, again, should be key to the archive. Agreed. It, it just leads into those cards naturally. It right. also filters them in matchups where they're dead because they are very swinging cards. They're great in some situations, weaker in others. So it's doing that trick, can turn it into something better. And again, much like Inquisitor Captain, Key to the Archive is just, it's too good. I have to assume something will change about this card as time goes on because it sort of congeals the end game around it. You will always be looking to push to these huge mana thresholds where there's I won't even say there's no cost. There's strictly upside to trying to ramp to a higher mana threshold. And as long as that's true, I, I can't see all the control decks in the format gravitating around this card. So Yeah, the interesting thing is that I can see pretty clear nerfs that they could do for Tyrant and Captain, but Key to the Archive is a weird one where presumably you want it to still be a player. You just don't want it to outclass everything. Right. Like you don't want it to be the only end game, right? So for Tyrant, it's like, okay, maybe you shave a toughness off it yep. or whatever. Yeah, a lot of knobs. Uh, Inquisitor Captain could be like you up the requisite number again, could like adjust power toughness, whatever. I, I think White White 2 is interesting as well for Inquisitor Captain. Yeah, it being splashable is, is maybe not like the current problem, but like could become one. Yep. And basically just like adding nerfs, even if they don't seem like they do a lot, like they, they actually do. Yeah, I, look for. I, I hope again that Alchemy's approach are minor nerfs like that. I, yes. I don't want them to drive cards into the ground. That's the only way you can make this somewhat tenable if you're not giving back wild cards. You have to just make them slightly, slightly worse. But until we have evidence of that, I'm not going to assume that's what they do because I, I just don't know. I don't know what they're thinking anymore. But with Key to the Archive, you're right. It's harder because there's only a few numbers to change, right? You can make it cost five mana, it's unplayable. As far as I can tell, you know, you could go real dramatic and like go to hyper focus end games and make it like six mana to get three mana. That's that's interesting. It probably, again, pushes it out of the realm of viability, except in very it's, odd. It's not a four of anymore. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. You can you can adjust the spell book. You the can spell book ad- is adjust interesting. Yeah. what kind of mana it makes, although that's the smallest nerf. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure what they're going to do. It's probably what I'm most interested to see how they adjust, but I don't I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's like it's not ruining the format, it's just de-optimizing it, is what I would say. And it makes these end games very clear. And I would rather not deal with it. And also there's like the randomness aspect, which, you know, as magic players we're almost certainly not going to love. I it, it's been occasionally fun, but I've I've had my fill of approach of the second sun, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, adjusting the spell book is maybe pretty reasonable to me too, but I think just doing s- stuff that's like kind of heavy handed where it's like add a mana or whatever kind of just nukes it, which is not what they want. And like we've seen them take a, you know, like a, I don't know, more nuanced approach with how they change Chariot and uh, Goldspan Dragon 2, where, like, you know, Chariot very easily could have been just, like, out of mana, but instead they're just like, oh, no, we're just going to, like, redo the card completely. And, like, that did kind of nuke it from Orbit. Yeah, but- yeah it's gone. You don't see it in this format. And, you know, uh, uh, to some extent, Alrond's Epiphany, gone. Well, yeah, Om- th- that one. Omnath has not done it, you know? So it's like, what are they going to do with these cards where you're thinking th- there's no return of value here? That's the whole problem. So if there's no return of value, you need to preserve the playability of these cards. And if you put out just a stupid blog post that told me you understood that fact, then maybe I could buy into what you're doing right now. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I I am hopeful that they will take a nuanced approach to making changes and not just do the heavy-handed add a mana, basically kill the card. But for Key to the Archive, it's a little bit more different. For the other cards, I would just expect them to get 
you know, uh, dinged a little bit and still probably be reasonable, but maybe it just, you know, opens up the format instead of like the thing that you bought into is like the best thing to be doing. Now you're, you actually are like, eh, maybe I need to buy into something else. Cause like, this is not quite cutting it, which sucks when you're talking about not getting a return. Right. That's what you're trying to avoid, I think. And it's, it's, it's a real challenge. Uh, so for the control decks you, you mentioned, is it before kind of like throwing Azorius in there? Like, oh yeah, this is an option. I kind of like Azorius better, even though is it feels like cleaner and less clunky to me. It just seems like Azorius has better answers. No, I, I actually agree with you right now. I think Divine Purge is a really important card. Uh, and I, like I mentioned, I think like sizing can be iffy. You sort of need to... If, if you are is it you still need to be doing the galvanic iteration you know very responsive fading hope type setups where you're just buying right. time and then you snowball the game i don't think you can just play pure control in those colors it has to look a little bit different and maybe it's like maximizing holebreaker horror maybe it's still just an alrin's epiphany deck which i think is fairly interesting you can do some stuff with discover the formula where all this stuff snowballs on itself I, i've experimented in that space i don't think is it is dead by any means but i think if you're just looking for solved equation this is what is good in the format i think azorius has an edge and to some extent esper uh even jeskai i think is worth a look as well but it's, yeah. it's just so important to have clean answers yep agreed but yeah because of how badly things snowball it's like once you fall behind a little bit like you're just toast yep and i think that that's maybe one of the the few downsides of the the red deck I was working on was that if you, you know, if you do fall behind, there's just not really a whole lot you can do unless uh, the sweeper is good in the matchup. And it's just like, well, whatever you can't solve everything. Right. No, that's true. Uh, You're always going to have to have some weaknesses. Yeah. Overall, I liked it. I, I enjoyed the games that I played and I wish that there was like more of a reason to buy in and that people could do so with confidence. Like this is going to be, a supported thing and there's going to be fewer feel bad moments and whatever, because already like this is much better than standard. Yes. But if you have a better understanding of what you're getting when you register for a standard tournament or like buy into a standard format, I, I don't think that there's like any comparison. I, I feel like I would still just rather do that. Yeah. You need to establish trust clarity with how the format's going to be managed. And look, it's a brand new format. These things take time for sure. Of course. But- one of the ways to do it is with clear and open communication. That has not been the approach thus far. I am hopeful that changes over time. I am hopeful there's moving pieces that are all being put in the right place. I'm hopeful that, you know, Christmas break is over. Wh- whatever it takes, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just hopeful that there is more of a, a focus on this format because it needs it. It needs it to survive. It's so important that this gets extra love and care. The baseline love and care is not enough. And then it can be something special. But I, I am frustrated in the moment. I probably will skip this arena open. And if, if you are playing, I encourage you to use the cards you already have because you have to, you got to send a message with the wallet. And that's the only way to make clear this is, this is not going to work. And if alchemy stuff doesn't sell, maybe the message starts getting across. Yeah. The, the problem there is that they might interpret that as the wrong thing. Oh, people hate alchemy versus like, oh, we could have handled this better. This up. Yes. Yeah, well, all data is manipulatable. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, that has been a recurring trend. So who knows? I, I will just continue to be hopeful. Uh, not optimistic, though. I no longer am optimistic about anything. I, I just hope. Yeah, I guess I guess that's a similar way uh, that I would put it, where in theory, alchemy could end up being pretty good. In theory, uh, you get Pioneer on Magic Arena, and that bodes well. You know, but it's like whether or not we have any confidence that these things are going to happen or they're going to be implemented well. It's like, eh, not really. So, yep, we'll see. But things aren't quite over and done with yet. It's not Let's all doom not. and gloom. Let's hope not. Game. Good luck.